G'day, I'm Ash. Welcome yourselves back to Tank Mechanic Simulator. The BT-7 has mysteriously continued its evolution. Probably end up by finishing that build later down the line, but it is pink. I did tell you guys that it would be pink after I completed the King Tiger. Speaking of the King Tiger, I actually need to go finish a couple of things. Right, so apparently she had a hole on the, the massive side. Right, I think that's fixed. And then there are the hubcaps on the actual vehicle itself. So let's go fix that one. Goodness, what an impressive beast it is. Um, it was these items right here. Oh my goodness, we've got so many. <laughs> Do I have to screw for every one? Uh, man, this is going to take forever. I hope these wheel caps offer some protection to the torsion bars. Subscribe for more. Okay, this one's the last one. We're finally done. The King Tiger is finally complete. Now we can shove this back in its museum, back where I had it. There you go, $264,000. But that's not what we're here to do today. We've got the Churchill and the Ice 2 over there. And in this scrapyard, we have two Hellcats. We're going to restore both of them today. That way I can make a little more profit on the side because buying the parts up instead of just you know, taking two vehicles, stripping them down completely and then using the parts and refurbishing them manually is, well, should I say expensive. So the first thing we're going to do today is fill in all the holes and do a bit of welding. This video is going to be an extra long edition. I'm going to probably make it about 30 minutes as we restore both Hellcats. But hey, I ran into some bugs early on with the press version. Uh, they since published a patch where they fixed a couple of things with the engines and hopefully there's no more teething bugs or issues. Uh, but uh, I had to wait a few days and uh, I've been extremely busy recently. So yeah, Hellcat. What do I know about the Hellcat? It's got an aviation engine. It's one of a, well, the most well-known aviation engine. This thing can do impressive speed, about 60 to 70 kilometers an hour off-road. And it has a very interesting lightly armored sort of, you know, vehicle chassis. Other than that, it's time to strip everything down. It does have a, a 90 millimeter or a 76, depending on which version. And there were provisions for machine guns everywhere. So, yeah. All right, let's take off the guide roller here and the guide roller support. Normally, you document everything and you take pictures of everything, and then you'd get out and smash absolutely every individual part, smithereens, take them apart as carefully as you can. And uh, in that process, come on, don't get stuck on me. I hate it how, how the uh, bolts sometimes get stuck. And then you'd go and restore all the smaller parts and then go all the, do the bigger parts out of that. Just looking around, okay. This game is incredibly funky. So, let's take out the air exhaust and several other things as well. Front mud guard. I really like this game because it shows you sort of the boxy shapes from where the original design started out from. Must be a hell of a lot of work to actually get some of this stuff done. Get this front cover plate off. Like so. And it really just shows you the bare bones of the interior of the vehicle. I quite enjoy that. All right, buffers, more shock absorbers. I'll cut to, so you don't have to see all this. And now that we've completed the hull, it's time to tear apart the turret by moving the steps to one side. Clunky ass mechanic that this game tends to be. Take off absolutely everything you possibly can. All the interior items. Elevation gear, the gun breach, machine gun box ammunitions for the 50 caliber on the commander's side. Traverse for the gunners. I'm pretty sure it's a loader's machine gun. Radio in the back and the actual gun mantle and the periscope. I think that's it for the internals. Surely there'd be more. All right, this is the commander's cupola. There we go. Let's take that out properly. And we've got the box lid at the rear. I don't think there's anything else for the turret. I think that's about it. All right, we'll strip down the other one as well. Okay, having done that, it is time to look at my favorite part of the whole entire tank process. It is the engine. I really like engines, and as someone of an aviation pedigree, first and foremost, this particular engine is really fascinating. It's a R975 Whirlwind, which is a continental-built 
uh, sort of nine cylinder air cooled radial engine mainly made for aircraft however it were produced in I guess some capacity <laughs> over 53,000 of these were made by Continental and 7,000 by the Bright Company built for the Beechcraft Stagger Wing the North American BT-9 the M4 Sherman and most famously the Hellcat it is a well, an engine that has a rating of about 300 to 400 horsepower and about 200 to 300 kilowatts. But there you go. There is a huge number of variations with this particular model, and there are a number of just of aircraft and tanks that it was used by. And that really, really is quite interesting because obviously it was land leased to other countries and they made local patterns of this particular thing. Anyway, we're done with the engine. I think we stripped it down as most we can. Now it's time to move on. So both engines have been sandblasted and now we've got to move on to the actual hull of this particular vehicle. So let's paint this one up and let's get it ready for, I guess, assembly. Now the fun part begins, hooray. Assembly of the engine particularly a lackluster part of this particular video game. I wish there was a more in-depth mechanic, or at least allowed you to move around a little bit f faster. It's incredibly clunky, and you're basically waiting for outlines of the particular items to show up in the, I guess, the part menu. Sometimes it won't show you some of the parts, sometimes other parts of the engine will overclip and basically, you know, once you've completed a set sort of certain amount of parts, then it might actually put you know, a bigger sort of thing around it, making it a bit of a pain to actually complete properly. Not to put all these pins in around the main sort of radial engine uh, pins, or sort of like the pistons. You're putting in the crankshaft, and the crankcase is an easy matter. As you can see, it sort of just keeps building on those layers, and you've got things at the, the rear that, that you also need to do crankshafts and everything else like that there's little pulleys and timing gears you need to put in as well and this is where it gets a little bit annoying i suppose like the game wants you to complete a lot of the vehicle at once and doing so will allow me to i guess finish the engine but it's still a pain in the rear like this mechanic system absolutely abhorrent now the r975 was actually used in the beachcraft model 18 the Grizzly 1 Cruiser, the Kangaroo Armoured Personnel, the M3 Lee, the M4 Sherman, the M7 Priest, the Hellcat, the M12 Motor Gun Carriage, the M40 Mon uh, Gun Motor Carriage, the Helicopter, the McDonnell XV-1, which is an experimental uh, helicopter, very interesting, a gyro uh, copter. There was a helicopter which was also powered by two of these engines, uh, there is the Ram tank, Sexton, the self-propelled gun, Skiorsky XHJS-1, which was a naval experimental utility helicopter, and then the Skink anti-aircraft vehicle, which was based on the Grizzly. If you War Thunder players will tell you all about that. The thing about radials is they have an immense amount of output. The firing order on a radial is really impressive because it does opposing uh, cylinders and opposing strokes pull out and exhaust gas at the same time. So you have a whole oiled engine working in absolute perfection. These things can purr and are relatively stable comparatively to engines of, say, World War One standard. The amount of output and the amount of raw power here, we, we haven't really even seen, unless you're talking about jet-propelled aircraft uh, that you can get nowadays. So... Whenever I see these, I think, well, my Cessna 152 might have an inline four. Not your typical inline four, your horizontally opposed <laughs> inline four, if, if that makes any sense. And really, these have so much more power, so much more output comparatively to the stuff that we fly uh, today. Alas, there are a couple of Hellcats uh, flying around, or at least driving around. But this is where the game gets a bit funky. Trying to get these last couple of valves and these cover arms, as well as some of the timing covers, absolute pain in the rear. So look, I'm trying to access it, and it's not giving me the engine stand. Sometimes this game doesn't want anything at all, other than to watch you suffer. Right, time to put the cannons and everything back together. 
we're now all going to basically repair everything in the other turret. Now I've got a couple of rusty pieces I can see there that I've actually missed initially. That's okay. We'll we'll take care of that later. That's not necessarily a make or break sort of statement. But it will irritate me as time goes on. So we'll address that in a minute. I'm going to put all of this back in somehow. Um, and I, <laughs> I really don't like that rusty piece. So we'll do something with that in a second. But let's put the barrel in. And then we'll thread the muzzle brake on. i surprised there's nothing else to it. Like you don't actually have to th you know, do anything. One other mechanic that is missing from this game is the ability for you to actually control... Uh, the overhead cranes that actually allow you to actually pick up and move the engines. I think that'd be a fantastic mechanic. Instead of having it automatically spawn on a, you know, the, the turret ring here that, that sits in the hangar, I'd rather it sort of be able to be moved from one place to another. Lifting it, putting it in, you know, making sure the turret fits nice and snugly and tightly would be fantastic attention to detail. That actually happens within the real world when restoring these things. You know, it happens with steam locomotives when they put on their boilers and all of their other sort of foot plates and all the other things. So why can't we just have a, I guess, a manual sort of way of pulling out and popping engines in? It's a bit of a fun sort of mini game. At least it will keep everybody entertained. Now, oh, hang on, what am I doing here? People always ask me how long it actually takes to make these videos, and I'll be honest, sometimes a tank can take up to about 45 to 50 minutes to restore, so I don't often showcase all of that footage. Uh, hull interior is good, turret exterior is fantastic, and now I suppose we work on the lower hand. So if both engines are done, both turrets are done, I guess now the only thing left to do is the dreaded running gears to track the internals of the actual hulls. That's what we've done now is the easy bit. So I guess we'll do one of the sides here. And uh, it's basically the same as the other side, although we actually will need to put all the torsion bars in as well as these brackets, which uh, so many buffers and torsion bar brackets and just things. There we go, come on. Again, the game can be a bit glitchy. That's okay. Put on all suspension arms and the shock absorbers. This thing had a surprising amount. It makes you really appreciate these vehicles for what they were. You know, wartime does accelerate technology. Whether it's good for mankind or not is another thing altogether, but I'm not really one to debate that particular thing. All right, let's go ahead and we're going to do a bit of time lapse because this is possibly the most boring bit of the whole entire restoration. Oh boy, uh, just to give you a bit of an idea, restoring both of these vehicles at the same time was probably a bad uh, choice. Come on, come on, push in. Come on. Go, go. Come on, you must. Oh, I hate it when they have these like mini games. You have to like pull your mouse up in order to actually screw in. It's like, normally you just hold the impact driver and you just let the socket do its thing. Okay, right, we're gonna have to get rid of the stairs. Off your fuck. Okay. Come on. Put them in. There we go. Ah, what, wait, hey. Okay, apparently the game likes to also glitch. Well, there you go. I'm not going to complain if I don't have to put in the rest of the screws. Okay. Put in the torsion bars across the bottom. We're almost done here. For both vehicles. It's been an hour and 42 minutes of me back and forth, unscrewing everything, putting it all back together. I mean, there's a lot more to this game. Uh, like, you have to find artifacts and you dig for things, and uh, I just... It's just some, so much of a pain sometimes in order to do all those kind of activities. I'm not saying it's a bad thing. We'll actually get into doing those later, but, you know, I want to go and restore the IS-2 and I want to go restore the AVRE because that sounds like increasing fun. I'm going to get the Hellcat and the, the BT out the way at some point. So... 
the next video in this series is probably going to be a little bit shorter. All right, the mudguard flaps are going on the side. Screw into the hole in, in holes that magically don't exist. And put the track pieces in. Now, this will probably be the last thing you actually do. Although, having said that, you probably put the mudguards on last because putting on track can be quite tricky. Now, I'm not an actual tanker and I don't have any experience doing this, although I'd love to... I'd like to go work on some vehicles like this at some point. That'll be something that I'll have to do. Okay, that side is done. Now we've got to do the same on the other side here. And then we've got to do the other vehicle as well. Oh boy. At least most of the internals can be quite easily done. Alright, put on the road wheels as well and the other shock absorbers. Come on. I have any other internal parts to do? Okay, there is one on the front there that I've missed, the shock absorber. Um, again, too distracted doing all the things. There we go, put the road wheel on. And now we go put the rear track on. Okay, beautiful. Now I'll zip through doing the interior because that's probably the most boring part of the Hellcat because it is a very open vehicle. Go, go. We're nearly done there. We're about, I'd say we're about 75% complete now. Actually, I have to have a look at the statistics. I don't actually know. Come on. All right, screw that pin in. And that one. 89%. Okay. Well, we've got the finishing touches on this vehicle to do yet. Uh, and then we're basically done. So let's get our head and go and grasp that. Now, the tank is about 98% complete. We just have to finish off a couple of things with the engine, and that is basically done. So we're ready to sell. So that is the M18 Hellcat. Hopefully you enjoyed that short video. It was slightly longer than the other ones. Now I've got to actually go on ahead and repair the rest of that one, but that'll probably be later.